the U.S. market is much more established. Um, renting, I think, there has been much more prevalent for a longer period of time. And so I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years. It's really well established. There's lots of processes in place. There's data available and it's relatively uniform. So there's a lot more sophistication in terms of what that market looks like. Uh, compared to the UK, which is a little bit earlier on in its journey, is just kind of adopting that mentality that it's okay to rent and you can rent by choice. And there's a lot of reasons you might choose to rent versus buy. Um, and so it's really exciting to be coming in and being able to help see where it can get to as a sector and, and help along that journey. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast today. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Stacey Patton, Director of Multifamily Investment Management, UK and Nordics at Invesco Real Estate. Since its inception 40 years ago in 1983, Invesco Real Estate has been investing in direct property and public traded real asset securities across the risk return spectrum across the globe and throughout the capital stack. Stacy started her real estate career in the US at PGM Real Estate before moving to Invesco. She spent three years running a pan US portfolio of multifamily assets before moving to the UK in September 2022. Stacy is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, and it gives me great pleasure that she joins me on the podcast today. So Stacey, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to be here. Not at all. Well, look, I'm fascinated to dive a little bit more into your background, career, uh, the transition across the pond, the similarities and differences in the market and, and how you see things. Um, but a place that I always like to start these conversations, as you'll know, is how and why did you get into uh, real estate? had a feeling this question was coming. Um, so essentially, I'm the daughter of a contractor. So I grew up, as I like to tell people, hammer in hand, was on job sites from the time I was probably about three or four years old, um, and absolutely fascinated by how buildings are put together, how they're constructed. Um, my dad, uh, as I mentioned, ran a construction company. It, he was kind of a one-man shop, if you will. Um, and while he was really good at the craft, he wasn't so much good at the actual business part. So that inspired me to essentially, eventually one day, um, pursue a career in real estate and kind of learn how businesses operated and, and one day be able to do it on my own. Um, so that's that's what originally inspired me to get into the industry. So your dad uh, worked in real estate, so that's kind of the gateway. And it was what, like the pain of seeing your dad uh, or like the area that he could be much better at or improve or scale his business and all the benefits that come off the back of doing that was a bit that he, he was more of a technician rather than a business guy. Exactly. And so how did that, how did that kind of manifest and how did that, how did you go about you know, trying to work out how you could get the business skills and and apply yourself. Like, what did you do? So when I was 13, um, the economy in the U.S. was quite difficult. There was the, the kind of global financial crisis was going on at that point. Um, and I started doing the bookkeeping for my dad's business. And so I got a firsthand view as to what things cost, where the profit margins lies, some of the things on um, managing kind of cash coming in, cash coming out, just the basic fundamental accounting skills. Um, and was meeting with his CPA and, and tax person at, at you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. Well, fast forward to 17, I read the infamous Rich Dad, Poor Dad book that a lot of people seem to stumble upon and then they discover oh my gosh, you can make this amazing career doing real estate, um, which inspired me to essentially open up a retirement account at 17. Um, as I went into the bank, the bank, the manager of the bank basically said, when you turn 18, come back and I will get you a job working at the bank. Um, I knew at that point that I was going to have to put myself through university. It was the oldest of three. My parents clearly didn't have the financials to send me to school. And so at that point in time, um, I graduated from high school and I started working full time at the bank um, where I was kind of seeing how in some capacity 
how loans are coming together, little bits and pieces along the way. I was a bank teller for a while. So um, that was a really good skill set in. And then um, I ended up going to community college for four years. So I was working full time, doing night school or a combination throughout and ended up transferring to UC Berkeley, where I finished my degree. So it was a bit of a longer track, um, took me six years in total. And during the summer between my junior and my senior year of university, I did an internship at PGM Real Estate. So I didn't even know that commercial real estate existed. I stumbled upon effectively an information session and went, wow, this is incredible. That is what I want to do. Um, so that was the original path. And then that took me on um, quite a, a journey in terms of an internship, a return offer, and the rest is sort of history from there. Well, I guess your experience, was was your dad dealing with houses or what kind of real estate was he predominantly dealing with? Yeah, so he was doing a bit of everything, which is probably part of the issue is that if you're going to do it, you, you probably want to focus on one thing and be really good at that. Um, but he was doing sometimes commercial properties. So like the fit out of, you know, Ferragamo space in San Francisco or things like that. Um, but also single family houses. So he he kind of dabbled as and when things came through. And so you kind of, your understanding of this like much bigger commercial real estate world really kind of came to the frame at P Gym. Is that how it, yes. how it kind of unlocked? And were you like, wow, this is insane. Yeah. So I, so as I mentioned, the summer between my junior and my senior year, I interned there. So I spent half the summer working on the acquisition side of the business, underwriting all different property types, and then the other half on the asset management side for their core plus fund and love the transaction nature of the business. Um, got a return offer to come back for the transactions role and did that for two and a half, two and a half, three years. Um, underrating three and a half billion dollars worth of transactions across property types because I realized if I truly wanted to succeed in this business and who knows, maybe one day have my own portfolio or, you know, TBD on what that looked like at that point in time, I knew that at the very basics, you have to understand how you make a profit, how you lose money, how you can restructure things when they don't work well. Um, and, and all of that was really something that I gained during that time on the acquisitions part of the business. At school, kind of like growing up to university, what kind of kid were you? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably because it's no surprise, I was a bit of a nerd. Um, so I was student government president um, in my community college that transitioned over when I went to UC Berkeley at the Haas School of Business. So I would say always pretty inquisitive. Um, and I think I'm just naturally a curious person. So that's served me well thus far. And like strong with maths and finance. And so that was like, you had a really good basis and a, and a financial acumen. So when you were underwriting this kind of real estate, you picked it up relatively quickly. Yes. Yeah. And so you, you touched on the fact, can you just, you said you underwrote a lot of different type of real estate. What kind of real estate, what kind of risk return profiles were it, was it, uh, and the structures of it as well? Can you just kind of give us a bit of a... An overview. Yeah, so I think you highlighted it well. We were doing all sorts of deals: um, retail mixed-use developments, logistics, repurposing big master plan schemes where you're doing multiple phases, office repositionings. Um, but about half of what we were doing was apartment development deals, and so that experience is what probably fascinated me the most. We started working on deals at that time. We were doing. Um, a lot of joint ventures, that was primarily the model in the US, which I think in the UK that is, or will be hopefully becoming more prevalent going forward. Um, but a lot of those deals we bought at the peak of the cycle and then land prices started to decline and construction costs went up. And so we were then having to go back and restructure everything. Um, so all sorts of deals, Mez preferred equity. I mean, we looked at a lot. <laughs> What, for someone Brilliant. who's listening to this, like what is MES, what is preferred equity? Because yes. uh, you're obviously kind of alluding to different parts of the capital stack and how you can access real estate. Yeah, so um, the easiest distinction, and it hopefully holds true in the UK as well, but it's um, if you, it's effectively 
a higher capital stack as it relates to leverage. So typically, if you take out a loan on a property, you'll have a senior loan, which if you default, the keys go back to the senior lender. Um, in the case of MES, typically it's a bit more expensive and that layer is on top of it and you have further step-in rights. And my understanding is preferred equity, you don't have the same step-in rights you would in a MES position, but it sits even on top of that stack. So yeah, we were looking at you're looking quite, at lots of lot. different ways that you could <laughs> you could access yeah. um, access real estate. And were you looking at also the the, the port at a portfolio level in terms of the balance of um, the allocation to these different structures and and types of deals or not? Not necessarily. So in terms of the structure, we more so we had I don't know 15 or so funds I think at that point in time. So we were out trying to you know hunt and gather for all those different capital sources. But that was more so the the fund manager's discretion to figure out how do they want to comprise their portfolio and therefore change it over time, et cetera. You were just deal sourcing and underwriting yeah. um, and getting products through the door. So um, at, at that stage you touched on, it was the kind of the multifamily or the, the, the living or the residential part of the market that fascinated you. Why was that? So I, I think it's going back to my experience growing up. I mean, always fascinated with how things were built, being growing up on construction sites where I'm painting or you know, helping my dad put up drywall or whatever that was, I was always fascinated by where people live and the impact that you have on someone's home is so important to their overall well-being. I mean, you know, we spent so much time in COVID at home that that became such a refuge for people. Um, but I think that was always just a passion of mine, that coupled with interior design and placemaking and building, you know, cities and, and places where people can occupy was just something I've been fixated on since I was a little kid. Can you just tell me about the, the, the differences between maybe the US living market and then the UK <laughs> living market? I think it'd just be useful from a context perspective, right? And I was, I was going to delay that question until maybe <laughs> later, but it's probably useful to kind of get that in now just so we can kind of maybe understand, you know, the, the, the playing field and, you know, the institutional landscape as well. Yeah, it's a good question. So the U.S. market is much more established. Um, renting, I think, there has been much more prevalent for a longer period of time. And so I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years. It's really well established. There's lots of processes in place. There's data available, and it's relatively uniform. So there's a lot more sophistication in terms of what that market looks like uh, compared to the UK, which is a little bit earlier on in its journey, is just kind of adopting that mentality that it's okay to rent and you can rent by choice. And there's a lot of reasons you might choose to rent versus buy. Um, and so it's really exciting to be coming in and being able to help see where it can get to as a sector and, and help along that journey. Um, so hopefully that answers. Yeah, very much question. so. It's like a much more mature institutional <laughs> yes. grade landscape over in the US. And um, can you just tell me how, how did your like role evolve and how did you how did you progress your learnings through that early part of your career? Yeah. So after the first few years working on the acquisition side, um, there was an opportunity that came up on the investment management side of the business, specifically working on residential. So Pru at the time was so large that it had a designated uh, team within their core fund that just did residential, which is what I was most interested in. And so um, effectively raised my hand and said, that's something I'm really interested in. Right time, right place. Um, the opportunity was to work on East Coast assets, and I was based in San Francisco, so it was really fascinating. I got to cover um, for a, a short amount of time before they rejiggered the portfolio assets in New York, New Jersey, Chicago. I mean, I was all over the, the U.S. from a geographic perspective. Um, but really love the investment management side of the business because it, it gave me an opportunity to actually live out the life cycle of an asset. Because when you're working on acquisitions, it's a number on a spreadsheet, but you don't really know unless you've actually owned something or worked on it, what that number is actually meaning. How much payroll do you need? How much R&M costs do you need to allocate for? How do you actually execute on the business plan? And so that was really exciting to be able to, to take that underwriting, go execute on it, um, and I kind of found my calling in, in that nature. Fast forward, so I was there for a few more years in that capacity, um, covering stuff all over, still all over the country, um, but more so on the West Coast at that point in time. 
and my former boss at Invesco. Um, I met through a, a random, uh, well, someone that I had previously worked with effectively, um, but a, a random encounter. And we had a you know coffee chat meeting. He was looking to hire. I wasn't looking to move. 30 minutes turned into two and a half hours. I left with a job offer. And that kind of was the catalyst to me making the transition over um, to Invesco. And at that point in time, the, the gentleman that I worked for was running the US residential sector based out of San Francisco. And so that for me was really incredible because I had the opportunity to learn from him day in and day out. How do you build a platform? How do you how do you make these decisions at such a high strategic level and roll out um, initiatives across the business in a, a, a pan US capacity, if you will? So just before we get onto like that part, you just rewinding a little bit. You said you moved into an investment management role. Yes. So. Was that, um, just in terms of the terminology perspective, was that what we would call asset management or a portfolio management role over here, aka like looking after course, standing, income producing kit that might just need some asset management work? Is that is that how and what you were looking at? So you'd done your transactions piece and then you'd kind of gained experience from an asset or a portfolio management perspective. Yeah, so, so very much an asset management role, but interestingly enough, I mean, it had a non-core sleeve. And so most of that was occupied by apartment development deals. And so about half of what I was working on was assets from the, the start of you're going through a pre-entitlement process with a JV partner to um, assets that we're currently shovel in the ground, building value add deals where we've owned them for 30 years, but we're now needing to re uh, essentially reinvest into those assets. So it really touched everything in between. It felt in many ways like value add type work, which was really fascinating. So the fund manager would be carving up and saying, look, to, to hit our total core return yeah. based on the portfolio and the dynamics we have, we, we need 2 billion quid to be allocated, just a small chunk of change to, yes. to more value add and, <laughs> and uh, development type deals. And you were responsible for still underwriting and doing transactions, but also managing standing physical stock that was let and operationally running as part of your role as well? So not so much on the transactions piece, although part of the function was to look at if, if a new deal was going through investment committee to make sure that we could actually execute on the business plan, um, but a bit of a different hat. So looking at can we execute, are these numbers right versus you know overseeing the model and the underwriting at that point. How, just in terms of like size and scale, how many units were you kind of talking about? A lot, <laughs> um, thousands. So uh, probably five, 6,000 units. And any one deal? Uh, no, total in aggregate. So Fine. yeah, I mean, I think it, at the, probably at the peak of what I was working on, probably about 15 to 20 assets and each one has several hundred. The largest had uh, just over a thousand. And these are big tower blocks, like vertical blocks mainly, or are they kind of lateral developments as well? Or? So both, depending on the market. So in Denver, garden style, which is like your typical three-story wood frame buildup where you enter every unit from the outside. There's no shared corridor space. Podium product, which I don't know what that would be equivalent to here, um, but concrete frame construction, but more low rise, so six or seven story buildings, and then a lot of high rise towers because you get much more efficiency, build costs, et cetera, if you stack, if you can. So you had like the depth and breadth of experience across lots of different product types, different geographies, locations, transactions, investment management, yes. some asset management work. So you kind of, you must've been running at a million miles an hour to get <laughs> that much experience in only a few years. Yep. Effectively, um, and it hasn't stopped. So it's. I think. I, I think I have a one-speed operator uh, mode. <laughs> to, to, like, for content, like what kind of hours were you pulling? Just <sighs> yeah, I mean it varies. So the U.S. is obviously quite different in terms of the amount of hours that, by and large, people work in general. I would say during the transactions phase, um, it could be sixty, it could be seventy, it could be eighty a week, depending on how many deals you have going on. So pretty full on. So you you get years of experience crammed down because you're working twice as much. Um, when I pivoted over onto the asset management or investment side of the business, I would say a little bit less, but not. I would say maybe average somewhere around sixty or so was would probably be pretty normal for me at that point in time. And did you want, and you you wanted to seek that asset management experience, did you? What, just because you thought that it would make you a better investment professional having sat on the other side of the, 
not the other side of the table, but having seen the next part of the process, right? Very much so. Um, because one day I wanted to be able to actually invest for myself. So I thought, I know how to underwrite a deal, but how do you actually execute on the rest of it? And can I slowly start to build all these pieces so that if one day I wanted to do that, I could. Um, and and that effectively proved itself out, which has been exciting. So chance meeting with <laughs> your now old boss in America. Yeah. Um, and half an hour turned into a couple of hours, yeah. which turned into a, to a job offer. So why why did you decide to leave PJ? Or what was the role that you were going off to go and do? Yeah, I mean, it really was a function of him. Um, he was the reason that I moved, just the ability to work for the head of a, a platform of that scale in the same office. I think that was one of the things as I was thinking about my own career trajectory in wanting to one day proceed in, in a role like his at some point. Um, the, the leadership in terms of that more senior positioning was in New Jersey. And so that makes it hard from a visibility perspective and just being able to learn about how they think about setting up a business, a team, all the different parts that, that run a, an asset management platform. It's hard when you're doing it via Teams or Zoom calls. So it really was being able to learn from him. So at that point, it was a lateral move, but I thought I can't solve for the learning that I'm going to get by just working with him. And that certainly proved itself true. And so it, you were like, what, one of the first into the, t in terms of like establishing this <clears throat> or what were you going on to, to like actually do? Yeah. So definitely not the first. Um, they, I mean, Invesco has been around for 40 years. So they, they had had a well-established operation at that point in time, but it was to essentially manage a portfolio of assets in Northern California Portland and Seattle, so primarily the West Coast, um, which is really exciting and, and full autonomy to basically say, here's the portfolio, solve all the issues, drive as much value creation as you can for our investors, and then let's see what other broader initiatives you can roll out at a kind of platform level, which which was great. And the platform level is more what, op operational, granular level? More more um, akin to pan uh like multi jurisdiction, so okay, to speak. Fine. Yeah. So, so some of the things we were doing at that point in time, we were rolling out um, rent insurance programs. We were rolling out. Um, it was during COVID, so there were all sorts of things that we were doing with lease addendums, as it related to if you lose your job, uh, you know, here's here's what you should know that we will basically support you and allow you to get out of your lease if you provide paperwork, et cetera. I mean, there, there were so many different things going on at that point in time. So it was really fascinating to be able to sit there and and help uh, establish some of those goals. So it's taking them on an asset basis and then rolling it out across the whole portfolio just to yeah. kind of make it standardized, more efficient. Um, in terms of like the product, was the actual product similar to the kind of product that you'd worked on before? And did it, or did it have like a different identity or was it targeting a different segment or occupier or customer? Yeah, very similar. The one nuance, well, two nuances um, would be, we started to work on some affordable products. So I'd never, I'd never really worked on that where the entire business model was surrounding taking an asset, um, uh, essentially putting some sort of regulatory agreement in place where you're able to um, capture some tax relief. And so that was an interesting model at that point in time. So that was something I hadn't been exposed to in that capacity before. Um, and then something else, which was really exciting, albeit I didn't get a chance to necessarily work on it, but I learned from just osmosis and others talking about it was single family housing. So we were one of the first kind of big movers into that space back um, a couple of years ago now. So that was just a great opportunity. <laughs> so what is the difference between multifamily housing and single family housing? So multifamily housing effectively um, is more than one occupier in the space. So it's, it's akin to a BTR scheme in the UK and single family is literally buying an actual individual dwelling or townhomes in some cases where they're all right next to each other for the purpose of individual families living there. Um, the interesting thing is that those assets are, tend to be stickier because if you're a family and you have kids and you have all of your belongings, you, you tend to stay in a space a bit longer if it feels like yours than if you're in a smaller unit that was purpose designed to rent. Um, so we were just getting into that space in quite a big way in, in the U.S. at that point in time, which was exciting. Um, and we haven't yet gotten into it here, but we have looked. So we've looked at a lot of deals this year and just have gotten outpriced for one reason or another. 
So, um, yeah, first kind of move or looking at single family <clears throat> over in the US. And is there often an evolution of people going into multifamily and then, you know, moving to single family later at a particular age or stage? Or are there slightly different demographics that, that occupy either multifamily or single family? I wish I could answer that question with more uh, more data points. I, from what I've gathered from just listening to some of the internal conversations, I think part of it is a natural life cycle. So when you start to have kids, um, it tends to be moving for reasons to be closer to family. So it is a little bit in some cases of an older demographic, but it's not so old as senior living. It's kind of the, the sweet spot in between yeah. being able to potentially buy something. But that that's my understanding of broad brush strokes, how it works in the US. So in, in the UK, we're obviously a nation fixated with home ownership and getting on the property ladder. Um, I think that's obviously changing given um, maybe the struggle or the difficulties of being able to, to do that. Is that the same over in the US? So it's a little bit different. Um, I would say the two kind of big things is one, it's a bit easier to move to different states in the US. So here, in, I would say, the opportunity cost every time you move is more is higher effectively because you pay stamp duty. So in the US, that concept doesn't necessarily apply. You're able to buy and transact a bit more freely. And here it could be up to 5%. So I think that sentiment is, is quite different. And I think just the mentality, um, culturally, people are much more open and receptive to moving different states for different job opportunities. So I think the combination of both of those makes it a little different here. So um, talk to me, because you, you were with Invesco for a couple of years, what, you know, rising to, to a director over in, in the US, what were you responsible for doing day to day there before you moved over to the UK? So essentially managing a portfolio of assets, um, totaling a couple billion in value and making sure that, that we're delivering on behalf of the, the investment thesis. So managing renovation programs, managing uh, development deals, overseeing all the relationships with operators, restructuring deals when they needed to be, um, a lot of legal issues that come up with tenants or, or random things at, at points in time, construction issues. I mean, there's so many different hats that we wear. Um, and also the valuations. So every quarter, all of our assets are valued. Um, which is how we generate fees as a business as, as part of that valuation. So trying to standardize that process. So it's so many different hats on, if you will. You're kind of like the, the conductor of 20 or 30 little businesses and, and each building is one of those, which is exciting. Talk to me just about um, the capital and how what type of capital is investing in, in this real estate and also how, how long term is that capital in terms of its mindset too? So we have lots of different buckets of capital, um, which should not surprise you. Uh, everything from value add, where the life cycle is typically five to seven years and, and higher risk, higher return, 15, 17 IRR, so to speak. But a lot of the investors are big pension funds. So if you think about a pension fund that at some point in time has to pay out a certain amount of, of fixed money at the end of someone's career, well, that money has to sit and grow for 30 years as someone pro, you know, projects out um, to the point of retirement. And so they invest in, in that pie chart a certain percent into residential or, or um, into real estate, so to speak, and then the rest stocks, bonds, and all the other typical asset classes. So we take that money on behalf of big pension funds and, and other investors, so to speak, and go invest in real estate on their behalf. So depending on the structure, the life cycle really differs. <laughs> Why why did you move or want to move over to, to the UK and how did that kind of opportunity come about? So it's really for personal reasons. I visited London in 2016 and if you can fall in love with the place, I fell in love with London as soon as I got off and saw Big Ben and was like, oh my goodness, this place is incredible. Just the history, the culture, being in a place that is probably, I would argue, one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. And, and getting to expand my horizons. I lived 25 square miles my entire life. And so wanting to grow as, as a person and really um, London seemed like the perfect place because I don't speak any other languages outside of English. So uh, although English, British English is a bit different than American <laughs> English as I've discovered this year, um, but it really was, was for that. 
So how did that transition internally kind of come about? And was it relatively straightforward? Because, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you don't have a British passport or, <laughs> no. you know, there's like visas and things to try and like navigate. How, how did that happen? Yeah. So it didn't just show up on my doorstep, if that's what you're asking. Um, essentially, I woke up in January of 2022 and I thought, OK, I'd had this dream since I visited in 2016. And I thought about getting a graduate degree or fi trying to figure out a way to eff effectively get to London. Um, and I, I thought the opportunity cost was too big. At that point, I was doing the job that I wanted to be doing. I, I, did, I knew I was in the right industry for me. And I essentially said, okay, well, let me see if there is an opportunity internally. That would be the easiest place to start. Um, and so I, I sat down with my boss in January and I said, hey, I know this is a bold thing to say, but I'm going to... I'm putting it out there, all my cards basically saying, I want to move to London this year and I'm going to figure out how to make this happen. So I'm giving you 12 months notice, but I'd really hope that we can figure out if there is an option internally. Um, and he said, hold on, we can figure something out. Don't look, let me, let's have some conversations and, and see if there's an option. We're a global company. You know, there certainly must be a, a case for, for being able to do this. Fast forward, um, I ended up sitting down with our, our US CEO, our US COO, our European CEO, and basically kind of got the green light all the way through. Um, and what I didn't know at that point in time is I didn't know the, the kind of more um, nascent sector that real estate, that the, the residential real estate sector was in the UK at that point. So my skill set was actually more valuable here than it was in the US in terms of the knowledge that I could bring because I knew how the systems were set up and the structure and I had seen so much. So kind of right place, right time, to be honest. Is that the same boss that you had the first <laughs> half hour chat with? <laughs> yes. It was the same boss. So you had yeah, a really good relationship with this guy. But I guess yeah. you're still super nervous in terms of how, how it was going to go and if it was even going to be a possibility. But you managed to move over and internally transfer. And yeah. as, you, as you've kind of touched on, part of the, the allure or um, the, the, why they wanted you to do that is because you could take the learnings from a more mature US market and apply them to a to more nascent early stage um, UK and European market. So you moved over in September 22? Mm -hmm. Yep. And what, you know, what were you moving to? Uh, what was the size of the market? What was the role? What was the team? We had some significant amount in terms of what we were working on. Invesco was one of the early movers in, in the build to rent space. We had our first deal in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so we had had a, a pretty good track record of, of deals. So when I stepped over, um, we've got a UK resi fund, which is... Um, 700 million, I think, in size. We've got a US separate client account that has a, a big mandate here in the UK. So there was a, a pretty good chunk of, of assets to work on. Um, and then there is a portfolio in the Nordics. So some of our uh, high returning strategies and some other funds have a, a series of assets there. So I, I want to say by order of magnitude, probably over about 2000 units um, and probably over about a, a billion in, in value. If you add up all the assets together. Yeah. So it was a really interesting portfolio. Um, quite a lot to sink into right away because even though some of the principles apply, so much of the strategy here hasn't evolved in the same capacity as it has in the US. So trying to understand the lease terms and how rent growth is rolled out or not, or just all the little nuances planning. of planning, building safety act. I mean, there's so many things here that are um, specific to the UK. So it, it took a bit of time to really dig in, figure out what do we have and then how do we best optimize the portfolio based on that. Uh, so and, and is your and is your role more kind of asset management orientated and focused, or is it more transactions and investment and getting money out of the door and, and finding new new kit to go and buy? Much more asset management related. So I, I will always love the transaction side of the business, but I, I think my skill set is is probably more so on executing at this point. So uh, working together with the acquisitions folks to say, yep, this deal makes sense. We can execute on that, or providing input on the business plan. But I love actually being able to deliver something and a building doesn't exist and now it exists and here's how it's performing, hopefully better than the business plan. But that's primarily what I'm doing today. And over here, does Invesco operate the assets as well as invest in them or have you got separate operating companies that you 
oversee and manage, whether that's you own them and they're separately branded or is it a third party uh, that you work with? So it's a third party, which is the exact same structure that we have in the US. Um, and I realize it's a bit atypical here to have that, but I actually think it's a competitive advantage because if you have alignment from operators or things don't go well, you can change them out if you need to. Um, but I think it, it gives a unique advantage in the sense that you can get the perspective of multiple operators, which is the benefit of, of how we have it set up in the US where we have six, seven, eight, I don't know, there's probably even more than that that we partner with, but you take the best bits of all of them and then you try and roll them out across the board, which is what currently we're working on now. Rather than just having like own, operate your own um, business, it's much harder to, to translate out or, or swap in if they're not performing or to the levels or if someone is better, right? Is that, that's basically what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think it gives, um, it just gives more optionality if that makes sense. So, and it allows you to scale up or down as you buy or sell assets. If you, if you have a platform vertically integrated, and you sell assets, it becomes a little harder to make financial sense of that. Um, conversely, it could be the reverse if you're buying and buying and buying. Do you, do you, lose, do you still retain the ability to get access to data and um, you know, through those operating partners as well as you know, those businesses that I talk to who might have their own operator? You know, they, they love the fact they can get all the data at their, their fingertips. I'm assuming you, know, you, you can still get access even though it's not your platform, right? Yeah, it's probably not as granular. I mean, GDPR, we can't get all the names of, you know, individuals, et cetera, which we wouldn't want anyway. Um, but we we're able to kind of get the basic data that we need. And what we're doing internally is we've created this year our own benchmark. So we've said, here's all the things that we should be looking at to operate these assets at peak performance. We can create these tools internally if we have these inputs. And so we're still doing that, that value add piece of it without owning all the data ourselves, if that makes sense. In terms of like the product itself, how, you know, what, what kind of product is in super high demand right now in, in the UK and, and across Europe? In terms of product, well, <laughs> I mean, Build to Rent is very popular, as you know. I think outside of, of that space, a lot of life science deals that are going on, um, a lot of logistics that shouldn't come to any surprise given where we are in, in the market. Those are probably the the favorite food groups, if you will, of, of the season. Um, I think single family re rental is, is taking off this year. I know there's been a lot of deals that have transacted in, in that front, yep. um, but that one's you know not as far along as the bill trend sector in terms of life cycle. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that will change over time as you know people's ability to to afford the stamp duty declines. It yeah. becomes a much more compelling offer for people. And where where is um, you know the actual physical build to rent product? Like who who's taking space in these in these assets? Like is how do you segment your customer base? And um, are they kind of like more five star, super rich, amenity driven assets, or is it more kind of affordable? Um, yeah, low amenity um, driven products? Like what, what's in demand from that perspective? It's a very good question. So it's in the middle. Um, some a little bit higher than others, but it really depends on the market. I think if I've learned anything from some of the challenges witnessed in COVID and in terms of performance across not only assets that we own, but just talking to peers um, in the sector, it's that the assets that were hit the hardest are the ones that are trying to achieve the very top of the market rents. And so strategically, um, I, I think we're not necessarily trying to be that. We're trying to, to kind of cater to um, a bit more of a, a broader population, if that makes sense. So they will always have some amenities. Some of our buildings have none in certain markets. You just don't need them. Um, and in others, you definitely do because now it's it's the the amenities race has begun, if you will. Where yeah. if you don't put it in, it'll be antiquated in ten years' time. So, from a country or a, a location geographic perspective, what are the nuances that you're seeing between um, between the different geographies at the moment? So it's really fascinating. So the UK, in in many ways, has 
emulated some of the parts of the U.S. multifamily model or, or built to rent model, if you will, where they've got amenities, you've got a higher level of service offering, concierge, security, um, and it, it's much more you're paying for an elevated level of service. In other markets in Europe, it's a bit different. So I'm still getting my arms around how each individual country works, and we're not in all of them today. And um, But it's been fascinating to see in some markets, for example, in Germany, you stay in your unit for 20 years and you build your own kitchen. So when you get a unit, it comes empty, shell and core. Um, in other markets, like the Nordics, for example, you put in your own light fixtures. So all you have is the little box on the ceiling. I mean, it's really fascinating when you start to look at how, how each market operates differently. And there's almost no amenities there. Every unit broadly looks the same. Um, and the lease terms, there's indexation in those markets. So some markets have indexation or, or fixed uh, rent increases linked to NPI or whatever their national inflation rate is. We don't have that necessarily here in the UK. I know we have it in, in some other places, um, Ireland, essentially. But that has been a really interesting nuance. Um, I've recently begun to work on a, our, our first build-to-rent project in Milan, which is the first real market rate build-to-rent property in, in all of Milan. It's 656 units. And there we are creating the market. <laughs> So it's really interesting because we're trying to figure out, well, how much amenity should we have? And do we furnish the units or do we not furnish them? And what I'm also learning is furnish there doesn't mean the same thing that it does here in terms of, you know, a couch, a, a table and chairs. It means building out the kitchen and the bathroom with the fixtures. And then the layer above that, do you actually put in the FF&E? So there's, it's really interesting to be able to, to try and make the decision of where do we want to set this because the rest will then follow suit. So you don't want to set it too high and you want to make it attractive as an offering. So they're very different. But you also don't want to get it wrong because 600 units uh, and 600 <laughs> couches at just a very granular level, like this could be a big swing in your underwrite, right? Correct. Yeah. So there, we're spending a lot of time with the local team to try and partner and figure out how do we how do we create this market and, and target a demographic and figure out the service charge piece of it, which is an element there that doesn't necessarily apply in the UK. So there's so many layers in each market which I find a fascinating learning opportunity to see what works, what doesn't, and, and then try and build off of that. Who, who are you guys typically competing against for these sites? Is it other BTR investors? Is it student accommodation investors? Is it co-living investors? <laughs> or is, is, is the kind of the, the, sorry, the, the industry and the sector all like merging in, into one and actually there's, there's a home for each part or each niche within niche on a, a, a big particular site? I think as a sector, it's still finding its footing a little bit. So there's still there's still very much a space for each of the niches that you described in certain markets. Co-living makes sense because you want smaller units because that's what people can afford and they'll pay a premium to be in a great location so long as they're just able to be there and they have good amenities. But in terms of who we're competing with, it, it, it tends to be um, very deal specific. So hard for me to, to generalize on that. But, but the... I would say typically it's it's the large other institutions that have capital to deploy for for BTR product, which is very popular these days. What what where's where's more demand? Is it the um, is it the capital looking to access the space, or is it the the demand from users to live in these types of products? Like where on the the scales is it tipped right now? Definitely more tipped from the demand perspective. So it's it's been a tough year from a, a capital point of view. I think broadly, as you see yields move out and what's happening with global markets, um, there is so much demand. We are so undersupplied as a market to the tune of a couple hundred thousand units in the UK. And that same figure, if not doubles or triples in other markets in Europe. And so there is a huge pull to build it. Um, the challenge is just having enough capital to deploy to meet that demand. We touched a lot on like new build and new purpose built um, multifamily accommodation. Is there a repurposing play or a redevelopment play of maybe old or historic assets or um, buildings that were maybe before their time that maybe weren't as amenity rich that, you know, there's just an angle there to to get them up to speed? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, 
inevitably there will be kind of brown to green opportunities, so to speak, where you can take an office building and you repurpose it into residential. It's challenging <laughs> because you have to deal with the light aspects and, and make sure you're getting certain things right because they were designed with other purposes. But absolutely, I do think that there will be at some point opportunity to reposition assets that may no longer have a, a purpose in their current configuration. And would that be under the same fund structure or that just be depending on the market and the capital and the, the return profile and the equity that's looking to access it? Probably more the latter. So, it, I mean, there's been all sorts of opportunities that we've looked at this year, whether it's single family uh, rentals, which we've looked at, uh, a lot of PBSA buildings, um, not so much on the co-living space, but but there are opportunities that we're starting to see in that sector. Um, I think it's just a function of does the pricing make sense and do we have the right bucket of, of capital at that point in time uh, to meet it? Outside of the, the US, are there any other markets internationally that you look to for inspiration or you look to kind of gain an edge on how they do things? Is Australia further ahead on the journey or is it li- or is it literally just the US and, and that market that's yeah, leading it? Yeah, it's the US. Um, I think Australia is a little further, from my understanding, I've never been, um, but I think yet. it's further behind <laughs> yet uh, in, the, in the BTR space. Um, and I don't know about the rest of, of Asia in terms of how, how they've set up uh, their kind of akin assets. Um, but I would say mainly from the U.S. I mean, it's the U.S. is massive in size and scale, um, hundreds of thousands of units, probably millions of units. So there's been a lot to leverage from that, which is has started to make its way here which is exciting. So can you just tell me about the the Invesco um, kind of like real estate uh, residential side of the business in terms of like the structure, the team there, and yeah, maybe the size of that and the plans for, for the future as well. In terms of the team structure, we are split by country. So we've got a team that focuses on the UK and the Nordics, which is the team that I sit in. Um, we are structured under effectively an investment umbrella um, where we have half the team that does more transactions, acquisitions work, and the other half does the investment management, asset management type function. And the idea was to bring them together to actually deliver in lockstep the best results. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we've seen that work quite well. And so there's basically versions of that all over Europe. We've got eight offices. So um, in terms of asset managers, we we probably have somewhere around 20, 30 or so. But the idea is to just grow naturally as as we're able to raise more capital. Yeah, makes complete sense. And in terms of accessing the market, are you forward funding or is it forward commit? Or how how do you actually, you know, buy or access access the market? Um, And can you tell me what those mean (laughs) as well? Or tell those uh, people uh, listening who might not know what those terms are, like the the nuances and the difference between them and how it works. Yep. So there's many different structures. The forward funding that you've referenced is basically pre-agreeing upon a price, upon a delivery date of the asset. So the developer who takes on all the risk of planning and delivering says, when I complete it, you will buy it on this date for this price. So the risk in that is that The market moves out one way or the other. Sometimes you benefit, sometimes you don't. Forward funding, um, in my understanding, because this was a little bit of a newer one for me based on on the way deals are structured in the US, Um, but it has an element of a fixed profit um, built in for the developer and you're basically helping fund that over that point in time. And then at the end of it, you buy the asset um, for, for somewhat of a set price, but you're a little bit longer in that journey with them. And then a joint venture structure, which is probably my favorite structure, which uh, comes as no surprise, uh, is when uh, essentially one group is the developer and takes on all the execution risk of building on time, on budget, um, according to the specs and the plans. And then the other group is the funder. And so you share in that relationship. And and because we're doing the funding of that, there is what's called a promote structure where the developer gets an outsized amount of um, equity out of the deal. They put in, I don't know, somewhere between five, 10% for a co-investment and they can make 20, 30% in terms of the IRR at the end if they hit it right. And so it really motivates them to deliver on time, under budget, you're much more, I think joined, which is great. And they, they're they very much aligned to deliver the best product. So unit mix, units that are gonna sell versus just 
the densification of properties where you're building as many units as possible, but they're going to be quite difficult. And, and it may not be them that's ultimately doing the leasing at the end of the day because they already have a price and they'll be gone. Um, and then wholly owned deals where you are the developer. We have one instance of that, um, which uh, has been really interesting to work on. So where we're actually taking on all of the risk <laughs> and acting in that capacity. So there's so many different types of structures. Um, to answer your original question, which was what are we seeing and what types of deals are we doing? Um, I would say we're still seeing a lot of forward funding deals, um, some joint venture deals. And, and I think broadly, the hope is that as an industry, we shift more towards that JV model. That's my hope, but that's ideally what we're hoping to try and build out going forward. How do you work out which partner from a JV perspective to get into bed literally? Yeah, with? it's a really good question. I mean, it takes a lot of due diligence because the key risk on that is that you are married effectively on a deal for the better part of five, six, seven years, depending on that life cycle. So we very thoroughly vet the partners that we do deals with. Um, the, the deal that we've done with now a, a, a developer here in the UK, we went through six months of due diligence, talking with past partners, operators, I mean, really understanding how are they when things go wrong, because they inevitably always do, something happens. Are they going to be there to problem solve with you or are they going to be um, a little bit more, you know, confrontational about it? So it's quite a thorough process. So um, as we look to kind of draw, draw this to a change, like a close, sorry, what, what, what are you like most um, excited about as we kind of open the door to 24? Most excited for 24? Honestly, most excited to keep delivering on, on the assets. I mean, we've made a lot of progress this year as it relates to um, restructuring how, how we operate as, as a country here in the UK and the Nordics in terms of managing assets, but now actually getting to live out that change next year, I'm pretty excited about. Um, and helping just the business in general try and develop you know, solutions to being able to visualize our data and actually make meaningful insights out of it for me is exciting. What um, what are the biggest hurdles that um, investors, LPs, people who are wanting to access the space have to kind of get their head around or get over to be able to be a really good investor in the living space? It's not an overnight in and out. I think because it's so stable, you have to have conviction that you're going to be in an asset or a deal for four or five years, and it may take some time for that investment to, to see the benefit of that. Um, but therefore, you're going to get rewarded at the end of it. So I think it's, it's more so a mindset of knowing even though in theory it's liquid because you can buy and sell, it's not like the stock market where you can do that at any moment's notice. Um, and so just having that mindset of, of wanting something that's more durable in the long term. So as we, as we kind of draw to a close, a question that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast is, if I gave you 500 million pounds <laughs> worth of equity, who are the people, what property and which place would you look to deploy that and capital? Is this my own capital? It's your own capital. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, I would invest probably half of it in the UK. Um, and I would do it, no surprise, in the residential sector. So I would, I would probably put 30% in single family in some capacity and the rest in, in BTR. And then I would almost reverse that in the US. So the other 50%, um, I would have the majority of that in single family there because I believe long term that that will hold um, more resilient in, in time. Um, and then the remaining... 30 or so in, in build to rent. And in terms of like the, the places, where ex where specifically <laughs> would you invest? And then in terms of people, is there anyone, is there anyone in terms of your network that you've worked with that you'd get on the journey to help you deploy the capital? Oh, that's so difficult. Um, the people piece, admittedly, I'm still getting my own footing in the market. So it's hard for me to opine on who here I would do that with. So I will, I will plead the fifth. I don't know if that translates in terms of knowing what It doesn't what that translate, means. but I'll let, I'll let you off. <laughs> but, I'll let you uh, plead. I'll let but you plead. On that you one, lack a um, that'll be difficult for me to answer because I just, my, my uh, knowledge base is more limited there. Um, in terms of geographies, I, I do have kind of a, a greater conviction on, on kind of secondary and 
hopefully I'm not offending anyone, secondary locations like Birmingham, um, where you're still close enough to London, you still have a really good amount of job and, and demand story, um, but you're getting effectively more of a, a, a depth of, of individual. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting things happening with the HS2, which will hopefully come sometime in the next decade and, and reduce the commute in half, which would be a game changer for that city. In terms of the U.S., probably states that don't have um, state income tax. So I think that's where you've seen the benefit of having single family rental there. Um, cities like Nashville, Austin, Austin, Texas. I mean, the ones that you hear of are popular for that very reason because it saves people 10% right away off of their savings. So that would be where I'd probably invest. And if you couldn't invest in BTR or single family? <laughs> what? If I couldn't do either of those, um, I think there's some really interesting things happening with data centers. I mean, if you think of how much data we use every day, I mean, this this is being filmed. So how much data that's occupying, that's never going to decrease. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I think self-storage is really fascinating, in, in particular in the U.S. and what's happening there. Um, a lot going on with logistics as as we become more consumer focused and we want everything today or tomorrow. Um, so those would probably be the, the three I'd look at if it wasn't residential, which obviously I'm, I'm biased on. Well, Stacey, thank you so much for joining me on the, the podcast today, sharing a little bit about your background, your story, um, views, um, and how you kind of see the market at the moment. I um, have really enjoyed the conversation and I'm excited uh, to see what you and the team go on to do at Invesco. You know, that rich, rich dad, poor dad book that inspired you from the first place, um, uh, you know, I'm sure is uh, a constant reminder of, of why you turn up to work and, and do what you do. So thanks so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague. Give us a rating, like, or comment it helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of guests that we should have on the show or areas of the market we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People, Property, Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. The team recruit leadership and future leadership hires for real estate owners, funds, investors, and developers. So if you're looking to hire top talent for your business, head over to the website www.rockborn.com where you'll be able to find a wealth of information or feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Have a great day wherever you are and I look forward to catching you next time.